important topics. Well, so what really, do you think is important? Well, I mean, the topics that you raised. Yeah, well, first of all, there are enormous, enormous disparities in outcome in medicine. It's not unique to pediatric cardiac surgery, right? That's why we have MD Andersons. I mean, in medicine as a whole, there are differences in outcome. And so one of the things that you bring up is that parents or patients should be discerning shoppers. This is a platform uh, position that I actually articulate all the time as chief of surgery at Texas Children's, that you should ask, 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 ask all the time. How many do you do? Who's on the team? What's their training? Objectively, what's their performance? Show me. Most, most shoppers don't do that. I say shoppers facetiously. Right. Most <laughs> families, parents, patients, come to the hospital and naturally assume that everything's going to be okay. It's a beautiful building and there are billboards on the freeway and all that. It should be fine, right? So <clears throat> pediatric cardiac surgery is one that's really uh, sort of glaring in terms of the differences in outcomes. Now we also publicly report and you know we very carefully scrutinize what we do so there's a lot of objective information but there are enormous disparities in outcomes. So message one is you gotta, it's your child or your life, <laughs> you should be very um, confident in asking important questions and I have you know shouted this from the rooftops <clears throat> Um, through the course of my career and more and more. The walk on water thing, I know intimately well. Dr. Me and I are very close friends. I did my fellowship there in Melbourne in 1990. We worked together for many years. We remain close friends. We talk all the time. I know Michael Ruhlman well. <clears throat> and that he wrote a book that was of such interest, he picked up on the, on the, on the issue. He figured it out that there was a methodology, and Dr. Mee is a brilliant surgeon, there's no question about it, but there's also a methodology that was translating into enormously different outcomes. We happen to believe in that methodology, and it's worked really well for us at Texas Children's. Now, the 3D modeling thing is, uh, it's, I think it's enormously exciting. And uh, the prototype that you show me there, that's, um, that seems like it's a good step. The ones I've seen are made out of, or the ones we've had here at Texas Children's and that people have brought me before are made out of some sort of uh, hard plastic. Mm. So, I mean, you get an external model, but you don't have the internal modeling that's readily accessible. Mm. So to have one that you could actually open and look into and manipulate and I would presume that over the course of time they would be able to color it differently so you could look at the different structures mm -hmm. differently. It seems like that probably wouldn't be too hard for them to do. Mm -hmm. That would be enormously attractive. Definitely, definitely for education. Mm -hmm. um, and you know what we're left with now, um, which I'm sure you probably realize, is that we, um, when we're educating young surgeons, cardiologists, and beyond who are interested in congenital heart disease or frankly other structural abnormalities in the body, we're left to look at post-mortem specimens. And they're actually not that great, particularly some of the ones that have been you know, fixed a long time ago. They're very difficult to work with. They're not actually really that realistic. So to have something that's more, uh, more realistic would be enormously beneficial. Now, uh, to the point that you raised earlier about, you know, having a model in the operating room and referring back and forth to it, I don't actually think for a really experienced cardiac surgeon that would probably actually be all that useful. Mm -hmm. Where it would be useful would be mapping before a surgery. Mm -hmm. To sit down before, you know, just like you would for a complex flight. You would have a complex flight plan. And we make a flight plan now. Um, all, all pediatric cardiac surgeons that are accomplished and successful have to have the ability to build a 3D image of the heart in their mind before they go into the surgery. 
the more experienced you are and the better the imaging that you have before, the better the 3D image in your mind is. So we have that. It's in our heads when we go in. Now that's not to say that we don't sometimes have to, or many times, depending on the complexity of the heart, have to embellish that by looking in the heart and trying to see how things are going to fit together. And that's because we're using two-dimensional images of a three-dimensional structure and we're building a 3D image in our mind. Cath, MRI, echo. And you know, there are some sort of 3D renderings from MRI and CT scan which we're using more and more. That's where the 3D printing technology comes from, mm -hmm. of course. So that would be pretty cool. And that would be pretty cool. If you had, <laughs> and, and I, I'm intrigued by this double outlet uh, proposition, um, because double outlet right ventricle is one of the more challenging ones to build a plan. Because many times we'll go into the operation with contingencies. Can you do a two ventricle repair? Can you do, do you have to do a single ventricle repair? What would be at risk? And to have a model where you could actually map it out in advance, that would be uh, quite useful. One of the um, things that Enrique told me was that he, he saw a huge benefit for this was um, in creating a patches and going into so practicing the patches because he <coughs> can end up spending a lot of time on the pump and, and, and have a patch that doesn't fit correctly. Um, and so he felt like that's something that uh, 3D modeling, that practicing beforehand would be really beneficial in cutting his patches. Do you think that is oh, an application? For me, probably not. For me, probably not. But, uh, I mean, I get the point. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I, would, I would posit a whole different premise about that. This is a little far-reaching, actually, but it seems to me, now you have to, you have to give me credit for this. Don't take yeah, this we'll idea. <laughs> you have to give me credit for this, because I've had this idea for a long time. Yeah. The patches actually aren't that big of a deal, frankly. Okay. Building these patches inside the heart, it's not that big of a deal. It's really not. And the more experienced you become, the more, it's not the patches that's the problem, it's the decision about making the patch that's the problem. Mm -hmm. And it's looking at how the structures are gonna relate to each other. If you build the patch correctly, you know, that, that should be in the bandwidth of the surgeon. Mm -hmm. It's the decision to try to build the tunnel or the channel or whatnot. That's the issue mm -hmm. in my experience. Mm -hmm. So, but here's something that I, I've been intrigued by. So we have all this technology. I mean, that's really cool what they've built. It's probably going to get better and better. I mean, you, you see that the resolution of the aorta is much better than the resolution of the intracardiac structures. Mm -hmm. The intracardiac structures are still pretty crude, okay. but they're going to get better mm -hmm. because the technology is going to get better. The mathematics is getting better and better and better. You know, we can shoot something from outer space and put it into a one foot square. Yeah. You know, the technology is there. It's just getting it applied. Right. So one of the things that we have that's an enormous problem in childhood surgery is valvular heart disease. Mm -hmm. Now your child doesn't happen to have that, thankfully. Is there anyone else? But many children, in fact, all the children that I'm operating on this week have some variation of valvular heart disease. What, what causes it? They're born with it. We don't know. Is it, it something it's some, are gene or? some are related to genetics and some we don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. But suffice it to say they're all enormously problematic. So our goal is to try to prepare the valves if we can. So to have a 3D model of a valve before you operate on it and practice the repair, that would be super, super cool. To be able to, to practice your repair, because the repairs are much more complicated mm -hmm. than building a patch inside the heart, mm -hmm. particularly mitral valve repairs and things like that. If you could could practice your repair and have it be realistic mm -hmm. and then likewise if you're training someone because when we're teaching someone to operate on the outside of the heart you know we're talking about a heart that's the size of a plum mm -hmm. it's a lot more comfortable when we can see what they're doing on the outside but when they're working inside the heart we can't see what they're doing so the trainee is kind of got to take that step of doing it where the where the mentor can't see Mm -hmm. So if we could have them practice on that, that would be, that would be a real advantage. And then 
the next step of the Holy Grail would be what if, so you, let's just say we have someone that's born with an abnormal aortic valve mm -hmm. and their whole, the whole complex of their aorta is abnormal, which happens. Mm -hmm. So the valve's abnormal, the actual arteries abnormal, the way it comes out of the heart's abnormal. What if you could take a 3D rendering of what it should be like? So you take what it is and then make a model of what it should be like and design, mm -hmm. design the operation to achieve that. Mm -hmm. And then the next step iteration is to use those data to build a bioengineered heart valve wow. to put in a patient. That'd be super That's cool. Really neat. That'd be yeah. really cool. Yeah. Now that should be doable yeah. in our lifetime. That should be doable. Well, <clears throat> I think one of the big issues right now is that all of the 3D printing that's occurring in this space is being done with grant dollars, mm -hmm. and there's no sustainable model because no third-party payers are are willing to, to cover Absolutely. it. Absolutely. We just had a we had a perfect example of that. I have a child that was born with a copy of cordis. It's in the public domain, so I can speak about it. Hard outside the chest. She didn't have a chest. So we we've repaired her heart, and we've repaired the wound, but she doesn't have bony structure. And so we wanted to build a 3D model of her chest so we can then make a plan about how we we're going to deal with, well, getting that done and getting it paid for and then translating that into a therapy uh, is enormously challenging because there's just not, there's not a mechanism for it. So that's, I guess that's part of your proposition. Think, well, and I think, yeah, I think that once, I think the this study is critical because once, and I don't know if